Walker, Jerusalem and the Battle for Survival by Dr. Nadmi Al Jaba from Birzeit University, which comes in the context of the traditional we started in 2021 when Azmi Bshara, the director of the Arab Center, the first lecture in May 2021 on the, the Nakba of Palestine. Usually we hold this, this event in uh, May of each year. Exceptionally this year we, will, we are holding it in the month of June. It's our pleasure to invite Dr. Jabi to uh, lecture on the situation in Jerusalem and the policies by Israel and the facts uh, it has uh, produced and on the impact of that on Palestine and the region. Dr. al job will be also focusing on the future of Jerusalem. Please allow me to briefly introduce Dr. al Jaba. He is a professor of history at Bir Zayt University and the director of the Palestinian Studies Institute, who was formerly director of Ruach Center and contributed to the cultural life in Palestine. He has many publications on Jerusalem and Hebron and is considered an expert. Uh, he will soon publish uh, a new book on the churches in Jerusalem. It's our pleasure to welcome you Dr. al Jaba, and uh, undoubtedly you will shed light on many of issues which preoccupy us and the situation in Jerusalem. You have 45 minutes, please. The floor is yours. Uh, as a professor, the most pleasurable thing to me is one of my students introducing me, Dr. Ayat, and my deepest gratitude to Dr. Azmi and Dr. Khaled Farraj for their kind invitation. I don't know when you want to lecture on Jerusalem, we should do so or not, for Jerusalem is present in our daily life, it imposes itself, or it has been at least uh, for the last two decades, and in an increasing manner. I don't know if I can uh, explain or interpret uh, the events uh, that take place in Jerusalem. I'll try this evening to go through some of these aspects, maybe through the lecture and the subsequent discussion, we can manage to understand some sort of, uh, in some sort of way, what's been happening in Jerusalem and the agitation and the dynamics which will be impacting not only the future of the city itself, but the entire region. This city with its uh, importance religiously and historically and political symbolism will be accompanying us and will be imposing itself on our agendas. I want to deal with technology as best as I can. <coughs> Some say the cause, the case or the issue of Jerusalem is over after Trump's uh, recognition of it as a permanent uh, capital of Israel and the American embassy 
moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and how some Arab regimes without naming any have been sending signals that uh, Jerusalem is not that important, it doesn't warrant uh, exploding the whole region because of it, so therefore we should deal with reality as it is and nobody can change this reality. This kind of uh, uh, vision has been some sort of a policy for many and the Arab and non-Arab support uh, has been waning and Jerusalem is almost forgotten. So if one wants to take a second dose of things and look at the images which are repeated almost every other day in Jerusalem and you hear the cries of people which reminds us all that Jerusalem is still there is still present and this cry does not emanate from Jerusalem and its uh, walls but uh, spreads to the rest of the region. Uh, this is one demonstration in support of Jerusalem in Beirut and we had others in Amman and elsewhere so therefore the case for Jerusalem and the cause of Jerusalem is a winner not a loser and uh, people's sympathy with it uh, continues. Before getting into any conclusions I will try and give some idea of the recent past although I prefer ancient history but to do Jerusalem in the present and future is more important. Jerusalem as you know was divided in 1948 to two parts both parts were not equal. Eastern Jerusalem, which became under the administration of Jordan, only made up 12% of the Jerusalem in the British Mandate era, and 88% was occupied by Israel in 1948. What is symbolic is in the East Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem is situated with, with all the symbolism it has. In 1967, when Israel completed its occupation and uh, after a time, the area was eastern Jerusalem was six and a half kilometers. Now it's more than 60 kilometers. Now it uh, borders Beit Laham and Ramallah. So the area of the United Jerusalem, the eastern and western, is 105 square kilometers, including 72 is in eastern uh, Jerusalem. So two-thirds of uh, Jerusalem as the permanent capital of Israel happens to be in eastern Jerusalem. This so-called municipal borders what were when they applied the Israeli law and therefore annexed to Israel. Of course, the land was annexed, but not the people who lived in that. So the people who used to live in 67 in East Jerusalem was uh, about 70,000 living on 72 square miles. These people have been dealt with as if they came to Jerusalem as visitors or tourists and decided to stay there. And because of Israeli tolerance, they are allowed to reside in the city and given the right of residence. They are not Israeli citizens, but they are citizens of another state which is not identified. They used to write in our in ideas that the residents of Jerusalem are Arabs but uh, for nationality but then they stopped doing that now our ideas have three X's instead of specifying that we are of Arab nationality. Other uh, steps uh, and measures I will 
talk about, but it's important to understand this map for its future uh, implications. This uh, explains what happened in 48 and how much of Jerusalem became under Jordanian control. Now all of this is under Israeli control. Right from the start, Israel, after occupying the eastern part of Jerusalem, relied on two points to impose its control over Jerusalem. First, the land. Second, the population. The population were always considered as a problem and uh, to the detriment of Israel is an increasing problem. All the ways and means Israel used to expel the population or uh, I'm not here uh, floating demography as a weapon, but uh, 10-15% of uh, the whites in South Africa uh, uh, managed to control the land for a long time. But what is worrying for Israel, the demographic factor is a very worrying aspect for Israeli life, really. Now, in the general context on the land of Palestine, when we talk about uh, Palestine of the British mandate from the sea to the river, Maybe for the first time, the number of Palestinians exceed the number of Israelis. Of course, uh, the figures and statistics are under Israeli control. They can manipulate them, but we are almost certain that our number exceeds 50%. And this is very worrisome for the Israelis. We should not consider this uh, factor of demography as something which just... Uh, happens and will disappear and Israeli Jewish uh, immigration to Israel is on the retreat and what is called the exit or departures from Israel exceeded the number who come to immigrate to live and settle in Israel so it therefore in in a nutshell the balance of numbers is a negative one so far as Israel is concerned. The Israelis have managed successfully to control the 72 square kilometers. They managed to squeeze the Palestinian presence into about 18 square kilometers. If we make some calculations, now the Palestinian uh, population of Jerusalem after 55 uh, years of Israel occupation now is they live only on 10 square kilometers. In 67 they were 70,000 or thereabouts. The vast majority of in the old city and its immediate surrounding areas. Now the number of the uh, the population is almost 400 Thousands, 70,000 have become 400,000 Palestinians. They make up more than 40% of the so called unified Jerusalem. The latest figure show that they passed 39% in 21. Now, this year, we passed 40% because our annual rate of increase is 1%. And if you remember with us that this permanent capital of the state of Israel with 40% of its populations are classified as enemies. I do not know any other capital in the world which considers 40% of its, the population of its capital as enemies and places them under constant uh, monitoring. I think on con so far as controlling the land and the ground, they made uh, huge successive. They managed to turn a large swathes of land into settlements, and they brought around 250,000 settlers. 250,000 settlers were brought to occupy the settlements established in East Gen in, uh, Jerusalem. So 12% are Arabs and 35% uh, 
of uh, Israeli settlers. The rest is either national natural reserves uh, and their land not available for Palestinians to to build. So therefore, the battle for the control of land of Jerusalem is a battle we lost in favor of Israel. Israel managed through settlement, as you can tell from this map, that they managed to <coughs> really to destroy the urban fabric, the social fabric the, in Jerusalem, and we see all the settlements surrounding surrounding Jerusalem, and some are either inside Palestinian uh, district or surrounding them. So therefore, we have different forms of uh, of uh, settlement which is aimed at destroying the fabric of Palestinian life and social life. So therefore, what can this result in eventually if we take uh, now a, a compass and we look at uh, this map uh, in a direction of, say, for example, five, ten kilometers, and we draw a circle, we will find that despite all the, pal all the settlement activities, we still find Palestinian people living there, although the aim was to make the largest possible number of Palestinians leave Jerusalem and to replace them by uh, Israeli settlers, they still fail. So this fact has not changed from the days of the British mandate until now. And uh, when I applied this method time of uh, the British mandate and the current, Palestine, uh, current Jerusalem. Despite all the settlement activity, we still have the presence. Uh, the growth in population, it's true that uh, today the We, it's important to understand these uh, aspects now. Uh, this is uh, the apartheid wall between Abu Dis and Jerusalem. Abu Dis, practically speaking, is a district of. Uh, 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 it's only two kilometers away from the uh, Dome of the Rock Mosque. This can apply to al Aizariya and many other little villages surrounding Jerusalem. So therefore, the, this wall gives you an idea of the kind of siege under which the city uh, is suffering now. Apart from this wall, there's been a large number of checkpoints that surround the city, so no way can move in or out of the city without p passing through at least one checkpoint. Uh, apart from the, all the these are permanent checkpoints. Of course, there are uh, other uh, temporaries and. Uh, some of these checkpoints, like Kalandia, have become like international crossing borders, as if they are between two separate states. The settlement under uh, consideration now happens to be on the Kalandia airport. Now you know why the Israelis sort of extended their hand into this area so that they can get their hands on the Kalandia area in its entirety with the airport and there is a Kufur Aqab district which is within the borders of uh, 
Jerusalem, yet it has become become uh, like a jungle made up of uh, high rises without uh, room to expand. So therefore, they uh, the, if the building was there for Palestinian families, would have solved the problem for many thousands. Jerusalem, as a result of the Israeli policy, has turned Jerusalem in many of its parts into slums in the perfect sense from a sociological point of view. 80% almost of the 400,000 Palestinians who live in Jerusalem live under the poverty line. This is uh, according to official figures from the Israeli Institute in charge of determining the poverty line. Although Jerusalem until the 1920s were a city for the middle classes, they were made, they were impoverished uh, gradually and uh, annexed them to the Israeli job market and of course, the opportunities are there only for the low paid. Residents of uh, East Jerusalem are cleaners by and large. They clean everything, roads, schools, uh, construction work, etc., everything. So therefore, Jerusalem has many of its young men working for low wages and this of course has led to a deterioration in the standard of living and the people who can invest had to leave the city because they are not allowed the opportunity because of the high taxes and the lack of land to build on and of course uh, people with capital, Palestinian people with capital went to invest in uh, Ramallah, Beit Lahm, Jericho and uh, if you uh, go through the Kalandia checkpoint in the morning, you'll find uh, people with capital leaving the city towards uh, Ramallah. But if you go to the Damascus Gate checkpoint, you'll find people in their young uh, early 20s going to work for the Israeli building sites. For this reason, the economy of Jerusalem is reliant on some low degree of tourism which is threatened by pandemics and other factors. From 1967 until now, the hotels in East Jerusalem have not increased in their size. Not even one extra room was built despite increase in tourism. The number of uh, uh, rooms available in 1967 is one and the same now. In Beit Lahm increased by 4,000%, in Ramallah 2,000%. Jerusalem, which is at the heart of tourism in Palestine, is still limited the same way it was many years ago. So the economy is almost ruined, relies on some sort of low-paid jobs and I don't want to really lower your morale in any way and uh, make you feel disappointed uh, when we talk about the old city surrounded by the fencing established by the Ottomans is less than one square kilometer so after 55 years, what's the number of the population? Now in the old city, there are some 40,000 Palestinians living there, uh, 40,000 in total and 37,000 Palestinians and less than 3,000 settlers. So after 55 years of using all sorts of legal and illegal methods, Despite all that, they did not manage to increase the settlers in the old city to more than 3,000. 
And if you want to compare that to the situation in 1948, it was less than 3,000. So practically have not increased from 1948 until now. So how did the people of Jerusalem manage to protect 37,000 people of their own is a miracle, really, and a sign of uh, unprecedented and unparalleled steadfastness. In the natural situation, particularly that uh, most of uh, the spaces over there are public spaces, uh, so we have the Aqsa Mosque uh, that constitutes one sixth uh, in addition to the markets, the schools, the cathedrals. Uh, so these constitute more than 60% of the surface of the old uh, city. And they have all been in the same space, particularly when it comes to the Muslim neighborhoods. Uh, so we have uh, the uh, Jews uh, uh, neighborhood uh, and also the Armen. Uh, Armenian neighborhood or the Armenian quarter. So the population was concentrated in the Muslim quarters. Uh, and these uh, quarters uh, are the poorest uh, of all the other areas. Uh, so they do not only undergo the closings and the challenges of occupation and the different circumstances as a result of the settlers and so on. No, the situation is dire on the ground. So the picture that you can see before you, so if you stand on the Zeytun Mount uh, to in the direction of Jerusalem, so the old Jerusalem is still still an Arab city, irrespective of the Judaization that was carried out the Judaism process. So Israelis, uh, after they failed uh, to control the old city and also to restrict the population presence and their control of the old city, they went to the circumference of the city, the outskirts uh, of the city. So the areas such as Tel Silwan and so on. So Jerusalem existed in the Iron Age, Age and also the Bronze Age. This was the city of David uh, and they were able to use technology, sound uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So they created a history, so most of which is illusionary. So when you enter there, uh, so they tried uh, to revive uh, so many, so many personalities such as David, Suleiman and so on. Uh, so if you enter the old city, this old city is no different than any other Arab city in the Orient, in the eastern part of the Arab world. Uh, so the smell, the goods, the people, the visitors, uh, the activities, uh, this is uh, an Arab city par excellence. Uh, and uh, if there are any failures uh, carried out by the occupation, this manifests very clearly in the old city. So people come in, anybody come into this area from Austria, from any place, they would realize that this is an Arab city. This doesn't mean that uh, the old Jerusalem has not, has not paid a very, very the a prize for it to continue. So before the war started, uh, they have uh, used uh, bulldozers uh, in the different areas, including uh, the uh, Maghreb uh, or Moroccan quarter. And within 48 hours, uh, and this was the first time I saw a bulldozer that was trying to destroy this area. And I was living in a closer area, closer to the Maghrebi quarter or the Moroccan quarter. So this was the first position that was undertaken in this uh, yellow 
line. Uh, so this is what is called uh, the Wailing Wall, what is called the Wailing Wall, Ha'it al Bura. And also we have the Aqsa Mosque and we have the Moroccan Quarter. And uh, the width is between three to four meters. This what was given to them by the Ottoman authorities. Uh, and after the destruction of the Moroccan Quarter, so this pleasant place uh, was uh, changed uh, and transformed into a religious uh, square uh, where soldiers uh, would uh, pretend to be serving uh, their nation, their country. So this is where we see the acts of aggression that take place uh, daily. And when you look at the different regions over there, uh, so there are a number of centers uh, surrounding the old city, including this city, which opposes, which is opposite uh, the uh, Moroccan quarter, which is a link between the city of uh, David and uh, Al Burak, or the what is called the Wailing Wall. So there is. Uh, In the year 1969, they took the uh, they took a decision uh, to confiscate the whole uh, region. So there was a Jewish uh, quarter that uh, existed during the Mamluki time, and also we have uh, this historical region. So 87 of the properties were Arab properties that were rented to Jews. Uh, in 1969, they decided to confiscate and expropriate the whole region, and they called it uh, the Jewish neighborhood. And you would find that in many, many maps, uh, including some friendly maps. So in the 70s, the end of the 70s of the 20th century, they decided uh, to settle in the different uh, areas and neighborhoods of the city i would like to reassure you that in the last 55 years uh, they were able outside the confiscated and expropriate region they were able to control 90 properties uh, so 50 of which uh, are properties that belong to jews before 1949 uh, 48 uh, so we've had 40 properties uh, that were confiscated there, some legally, some illegally, some uh, through uh, brokers, uh, uh, agents. Uh, so millions, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent in order to control this particular area. When we talk about 40 properties out of 3,600 properties. So they were able to buy, to forge the documents of 40 properties. And the remaining 50 properties, they say th that these are Jewish properties that belong to the Jews before 1948. So the law says that the Jews have the right to recover their properties and uh, the Palestinians do not have such a right. Uh, you've heard uh, about Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Uh, let's suppose that the territory, the lands uh, where those properties have been built uh, belonged uh, to the Jews. Let's, let's suppose this uh, because there's so many question marks about the property. Let's say that this belonged to the Jews. Uh, so Jordan with the UNRWA decided to build a neighborhood uh, for refugees where 50, 50 families were able to live. So they were not 50 families at the time, they were about 25. Uh, these refugees, uh, some of them owned the properties in the western part of the city. And the justification was uh, that those lands belong to the Jews, that is why they wanted to expel them from those uh, properties. They said, we are subjected to the same law, which is the Israeli law. But the Israeli law legislates and gives the right to Jews to recover their properties, but it does not, it does not 
give the Palestinians such a right. It deprives them. This is not an appetite state. This is not a, a racist state. This is the only democratic oasis in the region. This is a very, very, very tolerant kind of occupation. So it is us, just we are trying to recover. We have not been able to forget Palestine after 70 years. The problem lies with us, not with them. So Jerusalem so undergoes so many excavations. Uh, I do not know of a region that had been excavated as it is the case with Jerusalem. Uh, each centimeter is excavated. So Ayat is looking at me. I think time is limited. So we have had excavations in all directions. Uh, so we have so many lines that we know here in the plan. These are the lines uh, of the tunnels uh, that exist. Uh, so I do not know of a state that has the right uh, to excavate underneath your own house, your own property, without your even knowing it. This is all an effort that is exerted in order to develop a certain narrative. So this is the making of a certain national nationalism or nationality. So underneath uh, the yellow line or yellow area, there are... Uh, houses uh, that belong to Palestinians they want uh, they want uh, to have uh, a number of uh, parks uh, and they said that uh, David uh, used to own them so the occupation occupying forces the occupying country that tries as much as it can to develop such a narrative. So this is the Aqsa Mosque. So the Aqsa Mosque is one of the last uh, fortresses that exist. Uh, and the occupation. They have never hidden their intentions vis-a-vis -vis Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, so they have uh, 30 associations uh, in order to destroy Al-Aqsa Mosque. So we cannot say that this is, or these are acts that are committed by extremist groups. No, this is uh, an effort that is uh, carried out by the third temple. So these are the efforts that are exerted at the level of the Aqsa Mosque. And the Aqsa Mosque remains now in the hands of the Israelis after the intention to come up with the third temple in Jerusalem, Al-Quds. So even if, even if the buildings are destroyed, even if uh, the buildings need to be rehabilitated without, without, uh, the approval of the Israeli forces, the Palestinians cannot do so, unfortunately, in the, Jerusa in the city of Jerusalem. So this is the situation that we have here. So we have so many, so many employees uh, of the endowment, Al-Awqaf, in Palestine, in this region, who do that. Uh, they try to collect and get to know about the different regions that exist now. But there are battles that exist that exist every day in order to control Al-Aqsa. So this is a declaration that I have uh, taken a picture of. It is next to Ha'it al-Buraq, which is called the Wailing Wall, where they say that nobody is allowed to enter this region. So we're talking about uh, a number of religious movements that are very extremist, very, very racist indeed. And they have... Uh, prepared as much as they can. So this is uh, the so this is the uh, the holder for candles which is made of gold uh, and uh, they have uh, prepared the clothes of the priests that are going to be in that particular structure. Uh, so this is not something that would have uh, 
a number of extremists only. So this is a war of narratives that we see here. So it is a war of narratives by the Israelis. Uh, Israelis. Uh, it is a very populist kind of endeavor to develop such kind of narratives. Uh, so this is an area that had been developed during the Mamluki time, which is close uh, to the Aqsa Mosque. So this is a lecture that was delivered about this particular region where representatives of the military establishment were all present. Uh, so we have the president of the uh, or the uh, of the municipality of Jerusalem was also present there. Uh, so our neighborhoods in Jerusalem, due to the fact that we have lost our territories, uh, these have been transformed into slums uh, where many, many people live in very dire circumstances. Uh, so this is the old city, the Jewish neighborhood, uh, which is uh, similar to uh, fortress structures. Uh, this is a synagogue that was uh, restructured, rebuilt. Uh, these are uh, persons uh, carrying uh, uh, maps uh, of the uh, of the third temple. So they are carrying the maps of the third temple. So the occupation was also surprised as a result of the reactions they had seen. So the reaction started, as you all remember, was in 2017. When they tried in the Lion's Gate uh, to have the metal detecting uh, machinery. And uh, they were able to do that and have such equipment introduced in those areas. I went, uh, so people were praying on the ground. People, even those who never, people who never even prayed, the Christians who never prayed, uh, all of them moved uh, to pray on the ground. Uh, tens of thousands, I walked approximately four kilometers in between people to reach the closest area to the mosque, uh, people were took to the street. Uh, so this is a kind of a dynamism that is not organized. Uh, nobody has invited for such dynamism, for such, inv nobody invited people to go and take to the street. And this is what we see now, what we try to understand here. All the Palestinian organizations and groups with all due respect, uh, irrespective of their names, uh, did not play a role. And if they play a role, it is a marginal role. There is a kind of a self-awareness, a kind of an identity-based kind of awareness that pushes people. And this uh, has made uh, the occupation unable, unable to target such effort because this is a body with no head that is moving in a dynamic way. So they are very, very creative in the way they take initiatives. Uh, those people, most of which are young people, many of them we thought uh, had lost uh, their national identity. Many of them uh, dropped out of school. Many of them started working uh, with the Israelis uh, and uh, they did not have a very strong identity and they joined the Israelis to work, but irrespective, irrespective, and despite all that, they were able to take to the streets. You remember in Ramadan when there were checkpoints established by the Israelis in order to stop uh, Palestinians uh, from, the, from Israel to come to pray in the Aqsa Mosque. So they closed uh, the Jerusalem Tel Aviv road. Uh, they did not allow them to go. People left their cars, uh, their keys, uh, and they went to pray. The occupation was asking them to remove uh, their cars, uh, and they were able 
to arrive and go to Jerusalem to pray. So, of course, there's so many, so many things to be said. So the latest uh, manifestation that shows the level of challenge and that has made the occupation unable to deal with the situation. They were in an awkward situation. So it was uh, the funeral of Shirin Abu Aqla, where people were unified. Uh, so this was a manifestation of all the aspects that are known amongst Palestinians. Uh, simplicity. So it was a Christian lady that was assassinated in a premeditative way, mm, premeditated way. So we have seen after Jerusalem had gone all through through all these things. Uh, but what has happened in Jerusalem is the most important thing. What has happened in the French hospital. So this is a territory that belongs to Great France. Had been stormed by the police, the uh, Israeli police. And this uh, had made the Palestinians stronger. So they wanted to carry her from Sheikh Jarrah into the old city, but they were not allowed to do so. They worried that this would remain or uh, be transformed into a march. So we had tens of thousands of persons uh, following. I think Faisal Husseini was the largest funeral, but this is the second largest. But this is not Faisal Husseini. This is a journalist. Uh, hadn't there been impediments put by the occupation, the number of persons that would have taken to the street would have been much, much greater than what we had. So every year the Israelis uh, celebrate uh, their uh, victory starting from Damascus Gate. So this year the occupation stayed uh, and planned for this March. They planned for it for six months. Uh, they got forces, uh, forces in order to protect this March more the number of forces even beyond those that had occupied uh, the West Bank. Uh, so there was a cordon around uh, Jerusalem where persons wouldn't be able to reach the old city. So it was cordoned away from the old city by two kilometers. People were not able to go to the roof top of their homes so there were a number of surveillance airplanes uh, one whole country worked and planned for six months in order for those people to be able to prove uh, its sovereignty on jerusalem but they know they know that their sovereignty is no longer as it used to be so where is this all leading us uh, So the question that I posed at the beginning of my intervention, now I think the answer to it is very, very clear. This is not a lost cause. Jerusalem has not come to an end, no. There is a new generation in Jerusalem, at least our children. This generation has not seen the occupying forces, they do not know fear. And if they are arrested, they start chanting and the occupation, they do not have any answers uh, to be given. Yes, they respond to those who use rifles uh, or use weapons. Uh, yes, they, uh, they, they arrest them, but they cannot do anything when 
Palestinians go to Bab al Amud, the, the Damascus Gate, and they go and they start uh, reading uh, books. Uh, or when you see somebody that goes uh, to Yaffa challenging the people over there, you know, we cannot move from one point to another in Jerusalem without being s monitored. There is, uh, an, there is a train that goes close uh, to Bab al Amud, the Damascus Gate, uh, and then it goes towards uh, West Jerusalem. During Eid, people went for prayer, and the people of Shafat, uh, they got into the train uh, and they started uh, saying Allahu Akbar. And the train, the train was moving on as if, so the picture as if, as if the train was heading to the pilgrimage. So we constitute 40% in the old city. Yes, we have lost a large part of Jerusalem outside the, the cordoned area. And the... Uh, the occupation forces are facing difficulties uh, so our youth uh, are able to develop the project that would protect Jerusalem uh, so they have their own mechanisms and their own tools uh, neither the Palestinian Authority is influential nor the other organizations are influential but the youthful dynamism the youth uh, who know the kind of conflict that exists and the tools that can be used. Uh, so they are leading the march uh, with a huge body. So, but can this, can this lead to future leaderships? Uh, I do not know, but what I can promise you is that Jerusalem is going to be a source of concern for the occupation. So in Beirut, uh, when I was in Beirut, after the dynamism that took place uh, in the Lion's Gate, uh, I told them that this is not going to be the last incident. Uh, I told them that uh, Jerusalem is going to continue revolting and after one revolution to one revolution, there are going to be other smaller revolutions that are going to explode in their face each and every time. Jerusalem is going to embarrass uh, the Israelis. Uh, if we do not have a clear plan, we have to say that uh, the Israelis do not have a clear plan. They cannot impose anything in Jerusalem. We have lost, uh, lost a lot, particularly when the territories and lands were expropriated, when we did not know the mechanisms and tools that had been used by the occupying forces. Uh, so at, a, at the time when we were only honoring uh, armed strife, uh, so the possibility for us to achieve uh, things on the ground, this possibility exists and this is something that can be achieved by everybody. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you, Doctor, for this uh, very important lecture on the reality of the situation in Jerusalem. Difficult, yes, but still with hope and uh, in view of the steadfastness of the Palestinian people in the entire pal territory of Palestine and Jerusalem in particular. We have half an hour for your questions and answers. We open the floor now. Thank you, Doctor. Very happy with the, your lecture. Uh, from your observation, the Israeli laws uh, pertaining to third generation the property of the absentees, etc. You said that uh, they only managed to lay their hands on 40 properties in the old city. Uh, is, are there any statistics on the impact of the Israeli laws on life in Jerusalem?
Thank you, Doctor. Very nice lecture. It's been a while. We haven't had information like this. Very inspiring. You closed by something important. In Palestine, in Jerusalem, in, in Palestine, in general, and uh, Jerusalem in particular, about the question of organizing identity. We had a momentum in the past, but we did not uh, we f ma manage to keep it. Uh, the flag march, uh, we did not see much activity surrounding it. So far as uh, the Palestinian factions are concerned, can they pollute uh, Jerusalem? And how can we, as young people of Palestine, do something? Uh, we, we, for example, in 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 Gaza, and uh, we, I went to. I went to Jerusalem on my way, and uh, I, I uh, there we passed through the so-called Jewish uh, headquarters in Jerusalem. And because I wear the hijab, there were settlers there, but they still run away when I approach them. Okay. How can how can the high birth rate of Palestinians uh, consolidate the Palestinian presence and consolidate the Arab identity of Jerusalem? I'm not sure I understood all the questions. I'll pretend I have. The Israeli laws were uh, decreed, at least so far as Jerusalem is concerned, to control everything. I will not delve into details on these laws, and but uh, laws have two aspects, one to do with people and population, one to do with land. So far as the one pertaining to people, they are aimed to limit the growth in the Palestinian population in Jerusalem. For example, there is the law called the center of residence where, where I live. Although my family have been living in Jerusalem for generations, if they think I live I, li I live somewhere else, they will withdraw my residency card, which is like the green card. Say I move to Beer Zayt instead of being uh, really humiliated every day through checkpoints. Once they know I live in uh, Beer Zayt, they will withdraw my permit to reside in Jerusalem. All the people who live abroad or live outside Jerusalem face this problem. The second type of laws uh, I'm talking about uh, laws pertaining to the land. Confiscating land can take any form. Once they say it's for public utility or public good. For example, in 1969, there was a law called uh, Every country does that, confiscates land to build roads or schools. But uh, there was a family who used to live in the old city in 1967, the Balkan family. They could not manage to vacate them. And that family was well advanced in understanding their rights and they asked Israeli lawyers to defend until the case reached the High Court of Justice in Israel. In the end, the, 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 the court has passed the following sentence that in f for the sake of coexistence 
and cohabitation in Jerusalem, then no non-Jewish family should be allowed to live in Jerusalem. Can you imagine, for the sake of cohabitation, nobody but Jews should live there? Although the Burqan family had documents, deeds, proving that this property was theirs since 19, in, in, in the, uh, for four centuries. I told you in the, the entire 72 square kilometers there were 70,000 people. If the war was to happen in July, maybe the population of Jerusalem would have been 200 and 250 because a large number of them used to work in Jordan and in the Gulf and in July they return for their vacations but because the war happened in June then the late Faisal Husseini his father owned the house in the Sheikh Jarrah district because in 1967 he could not prove that he was he was not in Jerusalem because he was away the house was confiscated the house of Abdul Qadir al Husseini a very well known Jerusalemite so anybody who did not prove that he was not inside Jerusalem, his land was subject to confiscation. Even if he owned part of property, they would uh, they would confiscate it. Uh, the, uh, it's customary that most properties are owned by more than one person. So if Israel wants to apply this law, if they can do that, they can manage to get their hands on half of our pop our properties. As for the third generation law, that has nothing to do with property. That uh, pertains entirely to the population. B before 1948, there were some 90 properties belonging to Jewish people scattered in uh, Muslim districts. And some people have rented, have, have rented these properties either from the Jewish people or from the guardians of the Jordanian properties. In order to confiscate these properties, uh, the, the, they, they passed the third generation law which says until third generation only legal protection can be provided and in most properties now the third generation is the current generation so this means that this is a preparation for the future they want to confiscate the remaining properties any 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 problem they have they pass a law to solve it so so the entire judiciary system in israel is there to serve the, the occupation i don't know what one can do for jerusalem the institutes in jerusalem are in dire situation the ones who used to uh, get uh, support from the European Union, uh, some refused to sign the declaration by the European Union against uh, uh, terrorism, which included names of well-known Palestinian nationalist figures, so they could not do that. So all these cultural, uh, health, and other organizations are suffering now especially that what they used to get from the palestinian authority is not the the palestinian authority now owes hundreds of millions of dollars to to hospitals in jerusalem so instead of getting help from the pa the pa owes them money there so i don't know maybe finding ways of it's maybe it's not necessary to support 
like an entire state should help another state. Maybe um, can, you can, a school here in Qatar can announce itself as a twin school of a school in Jerusalem or something, and that way they can help. Yes, it's true that uh, the uh, flag march uh, did not have much reaction, but remember, they had six months of planning. They they had more than uh, 8,000 soldiers or something, or policemen. They surrounded the old city. They allowed nobody to... They sneaked in and out like thieves, like bats at night, really. It was not a victory march. Even even in Israeli media, there was complaint that what happened to our sovereignty if we cannot raise our flags freely? And even with that, the Palestinians managed to fly a drone which waved the Palestinian flag. The last question I did not understand. Ah, uh, yes, about the demography. I focused on this side, although I did not use it as a weapon, but so far as the occupation is concerned, this is a central issue. This is a source of concern. Now, there are some areas where there is an overwhelming Palestinian majority, like Galili and uh, uh, Negev and uh, these are very important because Israelis are being squeezed in a coastal area and the rest of the areas have a, a, a Palestinian majority. If the situation continued as it is without any drama elsewhere in the world, then the, the reservoir of Jewish people in the world, they are not coming to Israel. Even in the United States and others, there are now factors which are limiting the Jewish migration into Palestine. So therefore, this demographic factor is a source for concern. For Jerusalem specifically, it's very important because in Jerusalem, people want to live and survive. I remember when they were building this wall, uh, there was a, a number of pal uh, uh, people, uh, Jerusalem people who used to live in the na neighboring areas. They managed to find their way into the areas within the wall to protect their, their uh, identity. Now, now, the, the Israelis know that even if they live under very unhealthy circumstances, people still live. There is a place called Khan Sultan with 60 rooms, two by three in size, similar to hotels in the Middle Ages. Each room houses a family. So the bare minimum of appropriate living conditions is not available. Despite that, they accept that and they are not prepared to... Some own their houses with gardens, but they accept to live in this dire situation to protect their identity. I, didn't, I said there are things I cannot explain. There are many phenomena that you cannot... Uh, what is this kind of chemistry which ties people to the city? I don't know. There is something there. I don't know how to explain it. But, uh, of course, the dem demographic growth is very costly for us. Accommodation is another story if we want to talk about it. Uh, now, to have... Uh, some residents in, in like a f an apartment in a building 
one square meter is like six hundred thousand dollars in Ramallah. Uh, 180,000, 180 square meter apartments is 200,000. The cost of land is high, the taxes are high, the cost of building is high. The You pay something like $80,000 just to get the planning permission to build an apartment. How, where can people get that? It has to be cash. You want to buy a property, you have to have $600,000 in cash. Maybe if you get uh, s uh, s someone, a contractor who is more lenient, who will accept 400000 and the rest will be in installments, a period of two years or something. So people are finding solutions which are turning some districts into slums. In Jerusalem, according to Israeli statistics, more than 20,000 units have been built without uh, planning permission. Can you imagine if each unit houses five people on average? This means there is 100,000 people living in, in houses which are not, they not have uh, planning permission. This means they live under a constant threat of Israeli bulldozers coming any minute and leveling these houses to the ground. Nine. So 100,000 people live in constant worry. Despite that, their, their last observation. Okay. I have a friend who was the director of an important uh, establishment. Uh, he is from a uh, wealthy family. He decided to help his son get married. And uh, the son gets uh, something like $2,500 a month, which is a respectable salary. He wanted to rent him an apartment. He couldn't who couldn't find any property for rent for less than $1,500. So if he spends that amount on rent, so my friend decided to divide his own, uh, he, to, to, to divide his own property into two and give half of it to, to his son to live. I don't know for how long we can survive. The latest solution we found, which is problematic to say the least, I'll just share it with you. Some people started renting or buying in Jewish settlements. Next to my house, there is a settlement called Naviakov, only yards away from my house. If I'm not mistaken, the number of Palestinians living there, either through buying or renting, is almost 1,000 people. This reminds me of Carmiel and Nasra and other other similar places. This means this means the people of Palestine are becoming part of the Palestine of 1948. Of course, I didn't mention their role in our struggle. They're there in large numbers. They're organized. They take part with us. They help our economy. In the Aqsa Mosque, they, in every battle, they're there. D despite the fact that a large number of them live, live permanently in Jerusalem, although they are not registered as as Jerusalem residents through things to do with elections and the electoral register and that. If we include them, I think our population would increase by at least 10,000 people in my estimation. Now they are part of the social life of the city. 
I'll take a second round of questions. There is a question on the role of uh, Arab role and the Jordanian role on uh, Palestine on Jerusalem. Another question you said there is 30 Israeli organizations trying to build the temple. What is stopping them? And we ha there is another question uh, about the culture of uh, the city of Jerusalem. Can you please shed some light on that? We have 10 minutes. The role of Jordan, first of all, I have to be fair in this. Uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is under the Jordanian administration since 1967, the Jordanian uh, religious endowments. And they managed well to administer the buildings, the structure, the physical building. Structurally, they are in a better condition than the last five centuries. They renovated all the buildings, and we thank, and we thank Jordan for that. Also, there was a Palestinian uh, agreement for seen in Jordan. So Jordan would uh, manage the holy places in the right circ in these circumstances because if uh, uh, Jordan withdraws uh, from the management uh, of these holy places, so there's going to be a vacuum, and Israel would not would not allow neither the Palestinians nor any other kind of entity to manage. Uh, these uh, holy places. So the preservation of Jordan is part of the preservation of our rights. Uh, so in recent uh, time, the Hashemite uh, trusteeship uh, has been expanded to include a number of uh, cathedrals uh, and churches. Uh, and some churches see in the trusteeship of Jordan a protection to them. But when it comes to the political perspective, uh, I think uh, that there was no consensus between uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Jordanian authorities as it is the case now. It has never been as it is the case now. So when it comes uh, to the plans to destroy the temple, so there are a number of factors. Uh, so you remember during the Crusades, uh, so they have not destroyed uh, the Qubbat al-Sakhra and the Aqsa Mosque. Uh, they had transformed them into churches. Uh, and one of the reasons, and God knows where better, so this was an attempt to provoke the Islamic world uh, for it uh, not to carry out a kind of a large-scale jihad. Uh, so such analysis exists uh, but there are perhaps some other reasons, but perhaps this is not the right place to talk about them. Israel realized uh, since the policy that existed in the past uh, where they said that we're going to allow you to preserve uh, the uh, a limited number of your holy places, but officially, at least, uh, they did not want to provoke the Islamic and Arab world uh, because they did not want to have a large-scale recruitment of uh, Muslims and to make the conflict a religious conflict. Uh, so the Israeli people is no longer a secular uh, kind of community as it used to be. So during the Ayan uh, Riyan, uh, they moved that was or that existed at the time. Uh, it was a secular socialist kind of trend that existed at the same t at the at the time. But now the situation has changed. Uh, 
uh, now the community in itself uh, is very, very extremist. Uh, that is why the plans to destroy the Aqsa Mosque are much harsher and bigger than they used to be in the past. So the Israeli community makeup and uh, the makeup of the demography of Israel is going to produce uh, perhaps even more extremist governments, uh, even governments that are going to be more extremist than Bennett's government as well. That is why the mosque uh, is in huge risk uh, and we have seen there how they try to storm the Aqsa Mosque in an organized way. If we observe uh, and see those who try to storm the Aqsa Mosque, we have to say that uh, half of them uh, are paid to do so. We do see the faces uh, repeatedly appear in the Aqsa Mosque. Uh, and uh, the Israeli uh, government insists uh, on the continuation of such kind of activities. Uh, particularly that these squares uh, of Al-Aqsa are uh, considered public uh, parks. Uh, the awqaf, uh, the endowment, does not own the squares, the open squares that constitute in excess uh, of 80% uh, of the Aqsa Mosque. These are public parks and not a mosque. So that is why the risks have increased and in my view we're going to see much deeper challenges when it comes to the Aqsa Mosque. And I, I said that this is one of the last uh, fortresses that we are witnessing today. So when it comes to material and immaterial kind of uh, heritage uh, or moral heritage uh, in Jerusalem uh, is not is not different uh, so of course there are particularities when it comes to each and every uh, village or town in Palestine uh, so I didn't understand what you meant by the question when you talked about this heritage uh, so we have uh, intangible intangible uh, heritage also that exists in Jerusalem in Al-Quds also so we didn't hear the question unfortunately so there are a number of cultural centers that exist in the city we have the large of, of which is Zimu Center that has a number of activities uh, that uh, uh, organizes uh, theatrical performances uh, artistic activities uh, that are by that are organized and also we have the palestinian theater that uh, organizes so many theatrical pieces and also we have so many cultural events that are organized by the Palestinians, particularly in the old city where we see so many youth uh, meet uh, in the squares of the Aqsa Mosque. So this is what we see in those squares, in those areas. We would like to thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for this uh, very, very rich presentation. Thank you for sharing uh, the lives, the day-to-day -day lives uh, of people who live uh, in Jerusalem. We would like to thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, we welcome you once again. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. We're going to move to the second part of our meeting today, which is uh, the launch uh, of our website, which is uh, Jerusalem Story, which is the first uh, website uh, that uh, uh, recounts the story of Jerusalem through text, uh, through uh, uh, graphs, uh, through videos, and uh, also through pictures that concentrate on the story of Jerusalem and also the social fabric in Jerusalem. So this is an effort that is exerted by uh, the uh, Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and would like to give the floor to Dr. Azdi Bshara to give us uh, a presentation about uh, this website.
good evening good evening to you all would like to thank you for this great presentation and also we have dr tariq mitri with us the president of the board of trustees and we are very very happy to cooperate with the center for palestinian studies uh, so this is the annual Nakba lecture we hope that it is not going to remain an annual kind of thing uh, we hope that after perhaps two years and the situation would be solved uh, So we have uh, we have a website uh, that is going to be established very soon, perhaps in January, which is the Palestinian memory of all Palestinian movements. Uh, it's going to document the memory of the different Palestinian movements uh, and uh, newspapers. This is an unprecedented effort that is uh, being going to be launched. Uh, by the center so there is something that is annoying when it comes to the writing of history but these are just some ideas that i'm thinking about when it comes to this topic but we are very very happy to cooperate with you in january we're going to have the annual palestinian forum where we're going to have a number of palestinian researchers who are going to be presenting their research papers and this is going to be open to non-researchers as well. It is going to be an opportunity for people to interact with each other. So the problem is that uh, Palestinians do not have a framework that uh, links them all together. The Palestinians, they do not see each other. They do not talk about the Palestinian cause with each other. So there are so many Palestinian causes uh, similar to the Kurdish cause. Uh, we have uh, Jerusalem, the diaspora, also we have the uh, so many areas, uh, Gaza, and this is a strategic point. Uh, so we cannot, we cannot talk about a Palestinian cause if we have so many sub-causes such as Gaza and so on and so forth. So that's why we try to find a framework that would gather all these causes. So I'd like to remind you that uh, every year in January, we're going to have uh, this contribution. We as a research center, we try to strike a balance between scientific research. Uh, we are not organizers of fora or seminars. We try to be committed to our causes, uh, against occupation as we have proven recently to support democracy and to fight authoritarianism. That is why I'm very, very happy that today we're going to be launching one of our very important projects. Uh, this is a project that we've been working on for two and a half years and you're going to see the outcomes before you. We've been silently steadily working on this project and you're going to see the project before you which is the Jerusalem story which is an idea that started in 2018 we had always been thinking about uh, this Nadim also played a role in this the development of this idea we've been thinking for a f for quite some time about Jerusalem. So we have the Islamic uh, conference, also we have the Jerusalem committee, but there is no such thing as a website that would explain what Jerusalem is. If you write Jerusalem on Google, so the first 10 pages or website uh, that you would receive or get are Jewish and Zionist uh, websites so this is a website about jerusalem because we do not want only to have the zionist narrative uh, so we need to know the story of the communities so uh, this does not date back only to 1967 we would like also to recount the story of western jerusalem also so that is why the slogan the title is the story 
of Jerusalem retold the re recounted the re narrated the so that is why we talk about the Nakba and the different documents, the different maps, the different pieces of information, the different statistics, and even personal stories about people. Thousands of materials that are going to be published in English. Uh, and we've been working on it with a high level of professionalism when it comes to this project. And there's something that would be dedicated to common people and then to researchers who aim to know meticulous uh, videos, statistics. There are thousands, thousands of materials that exist on this website. I'm very happy that uh, we are launching this. Uh, this is only one of the projects undertaken by the Arab Center and uh, the Palestinian memory in January, the Syrian memory in Mars. Uh, also, it will be another electronic site, the Syrian memory site for to help uh, researchers to reproduce a virtual reproduction of the uh, Syrian memory. This is one for Jerusalem. I'll leave it there, and now we go about to launch the site by pressing the button go. You have to wait a few seconds. Now you can surf, and I invite you to do that. Thank you for uh, hosting us here. Thank you for supporting this project, believing in this project, and, um, and bringing us to this moment of launching this very exciting uh, website. So, Masal Khair. My name is Kate Rohana, and I'm the director of, the Jerusalem, of Jerusalem Story, a new website that we're thrilled to be launching here today. Under the auspices of the Arab um, Center for Research and Policy Studies, I'd like to um, just introduce you to this project and uh, let you know that the Jerusalem story aims to re-narrate a unique and historic city through a less known lens, and that's that of the city's large and diverse indigenous Palestinian community. Our work on Jerusalem story, as mentioned, began about two and a half years ago. We started very small. And we gradually grew our team and designed and developed our site. Today, the team is still not large, but they are very dedicated and passionate about working to make these stories and realities known. And certainly, we couldn't have done any of this without our team. Along the way, our understanding of the dystopian realities experienced by Palestinians of Jerusalem deepened, and we refined our plans and priorities. We grew to appreciate that the story is vast and extremely complex and that there are many aspects of it that urgently demand study and rigorous exploration. What we launched today is just phase one, and we want to acknowledge that there are many critical angles of the story that remain to be studied, and we hope we'll be able to do just that. So I'm honored to be here today to offer you a first glimpse of the Jerusalem Story website. Here you see our homepage and our um, logo and our tagline, The City Retold. The logo symbolizes a multicultural community deeply rooted in its land, despite efforts to encircle and control it, and contain it, sorry. But it will not be contained. Moving along the main menu, the top section stands alone. Let me just, give me one second here. Okay, this top section here is called the big picture, and it stands alone. Um, it's worth emphasizing that ours is not a news website at all. It is a research-based deep dive into a labyrinthine situation, examining it from many angles. Because the story that we're trying to tell is exceedingly complex and multifaceted, we built this section called the big picture to try and distill it all into one highest level story. So we click on the big picture, and then you scroll down, and there's, um, point by point, just the highest level uh, story that we're trying to tell in this site. 
and it kind of pulls together everything from all the various aspects and topics. And um, I hope that you'll all explore this after, right after this. Um, but this is the, the big picture section. So the next section of the menu is our themes and topics section. You can see here there are three themes currently. Of course, this is just a start. We plan to add more. Um, within each theme, you'll find topics. If you touch on the theme, the topics pop out. This particular topic has uh, three, sorry, this particular theme of foundations has three topics. And um, if you click on one of these topics, you'll get to the topic landing page. So let's check the topic la landing page for the West Side Story. Now, what do we mean by the West Side Story? This has been alluded to by both speakers before me. Um, and here you can see part of the mission of this website is exemplified. So in the mainstream Israeli narrative about Palestinian Jerusalemites, they somehow just appeared on the scene in 1967 when Israel conquered and occupied the east side of the city. In this narrative, they were found in East Jerusalem at that time and granted a status of permanent resident, which is the status that countries usually give to foreigners who are coming to resettle in their country from abroad. This status, which is very inferior and precarious, and has become ever more so over time, is somehow presented as a reasonable one for hundreds of thousands of people to live with for over half a century. Telling this story in this way, and especially starting it in 1967, erases the Palestinian Jerusalemites out of history. It considers that what is today West Jerusalem, which is entirely Jewish, is naturally and rightfully so. We've taken a deep dive into history in order to re-examine how Palestinian Jerusalemites came to be concentrated in East Jerusalem in the first place, and how West Jerusalem came to be exclusively Jewish in 1948 and to remain so today. This study resulted in our topic called the West Side Story. And here we reconstruct what really happened, which was that in 1948, over 70,000 Palestinians, full and rightful citizens of Palestine at that time, uh, were either left temporarily for safety or were expelled from what became West Jerusalem, whereupon Israel passed a series of laws to prevent their ever returning and confiscated all their homes, lands, businesses, and properties. This was so effective that even today, in 2022, 55 years since the city was supposedly reunited, West Jerusalem remains 99% Jewish. When we restore history, we can suddenly see the present realities much more clearly. We can understand where the Palestinian Jerusalemite is standing and see the city through his eyes. We can appreciate, for example, that as he stands in East Jerusalem, marginalized and dehumanized, and treated by the authorities and society as an un inferior, unwanted other, he looks back over at West Jerusalem and sees his family's beloved home or business that is so close yet gone forever. And that is the situation of the lucky ones. They are still allowed to remain in their city. There are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Jerusalemites who are exiled and who can only yearn from the, for their city from afar. So also, if we look at this history, we understand the past as prologue and we see what happened in West Jerusalem can also be the imprint for what could happen in East Jerusalem. So it helps us understand the real story. And this is what we mean when we say the city retold. So I'll leave you to explore this city more on your own. Let's move on with the demo. Here on the landing page, you can see that our approach is to combine more research-based uh, content with journalistic stories in the same topic. We believe that the research is the foundation for understanding the personal stories but the stories make the research come alive. So we feature both side by side. We encourage you to read them in this integral way too. So this is what a topic landing page uh, looks like. And um, just to uh, point out that on every topic page there is something called the story in numbers. And this is where we have a little capsule of this topic presented you know, as, as a set of numbers. Okay, so now if we wanna see one of these backgrounders, what does it look like? What is it? Uh, what does it read like? So we'll open this one. This, there's four parts to this West Side Story. There are four different backgrounders. I'm just opening part three randomly. Um, and I'm just gonna scroll through and let you see the type of features that we have in our, in our backgrounders. We have uh, very vivid, um, in this one they're historical photos because this is a historical piece, but we really wanted this to be a visual website that has a lot of, you know, uh, telling stories in photos as well as in words. 
So here you can see that this backgrounder is very um, uh, comprehensive and it also is uh, research-based and it has many, many, a lot of historic photo, uh, I I photos in it as well because they are part of the story and of the city retold. Some of these photos, you know, they haven't, some of them are known and some of them have been rediscovered. So <coughs> we think it's a very powerful way to tell, to tell the story. Um, I also wanted to uh, note that you, we have refer everything is referenced and the references are sort of hyperlinked so you can click on it and it takes you to the reference and back for, for your convenience. Um, if you want to return to the topic landing page from the backgrounder, you just go up to the top and go very, very up. Sorry. And you click here, view more on the West Side Story. So you go back to the topic landing page. Now, as I mentioned before, we have combined different types of content in our topics. In addition to backgrounders, we have personal stories, photos, videos, and much more. Let's say you're interested in personal stories. So you see these little labels here that show you what kind of content it is. You just have to click personal story, and it'll take you to, um, hello? <laughs> It'll take you to a page with all the personal stories across the website. I don't know why it's not responding now. There. So as you can see, this is a page that aggregates. By clicking on that particular label, you then get to see you out of the topic and you're into the personal story realm, and you see all the personal stories that we have on the website. And let me tell you, we have quite a few. Um, now here I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, first, that we have a, number, a good number of personal stories. We're always looking for more, of course. And second, you'll notice that many of them carry this illustration here, this beige illustration. Um, so what, what does this illustration mean? Why do we use it over and over? Well, the illustration actually means that um, the story is anonymous. And why are there so many anonymous stories uh, from Jerusalemites? because the legal status that Palestinian Jerusalemites hold is so very precarious that for any small wrong move, the Israeli Ministry of Interior can revoke it, leaving them stateless and deported from the city of their birth. Speaking out can have catastrophic consequences not only for individuals, but for entire families. So the fact that so many of our stories are anonymous is not by chance. It reflects a reality that nearly half the population of Jerusalem lives in existential fear every moment of every day. And this is so fundamental to understanding their lived realities that you cannot really begin to understand the Jerusalem story without appreciating this. So the last thing I would like to just point out is that at the end of every personal story, there is a little um, uh, icon box with a submit your own story link. And so if you get inspired after reading a story and you want to share an idea for you know one story that you want to uh, share, just use that little uh, icon and let us know about your idea. Um, so, for example, here's a story about leaving um, the airport, Ben Gurion Airport, as a Palestinian Jerusalemite. What is that experience like? Person didn't dare write it under their name. They had to write it anonymous. So um, this is that story, and then you go down, down, and you see there's the little share your story icon. If you click on it, you get taken to a form. You can submit your idea in Arabic or English. And I um, just want to encourage everybody to, to do that because we're looking for more stories. So let's, click, uh, let's um, look at some other types of content that we're featuring. So this is our, we, we explored foundations a little bit. We have a theme called Access, Mobility, and Fragmentation. In this theme, we have two topics, the closure and access to Jerusalem and the separation wall, um, also called Al-Jidar and also called the apartheid wall. In this particular topic, we just called it the separation wall. So uh, let's explore this one for a moment because I want to show you some other types of work that we've done. Now, here is the topic landing page for the separation wall. As you see, it again has the combination of the research backgrounders, the graphics, and so on. Um, but this topic also has uh, several case studies, interactive maps, and graphics. 
this is, uh, let's try to see that we have done these maps. These maps are really one of our, one of our things that we've done that we think are really, really going to be very um, informative and useful. So you, this is a map of the separation wall. Um, I want to just scroll down one second. You can uh, click it to full screen here with this little icon. Then you can um, move it over. And there's a legend. If you click on the legend, you'll see that this is telling you what's, what's in the map. Now, if you expand, you see that it gives you the names of the places on the ground. You can get a better view of this. And um, I want to point out that in this particular map, go back a little bit more. First of all, the Palestinian areas are green and the Jewish areas are blue. And you can see the interplay between the separation wall, which is the white line, and the municipal boundary, which is the black line. And I believe Dr. Uh, Joby also showed a uh, slide about how the airport is right here, that blue piece. And this is the separation wall that's shutting out Kufar Akab, this neighborhood here. Um, so this map is enormously enlightening. It shows us, first of all, that the root of the separation wall is very tortured. Second of all, that it has virtually no overlap with the official boundary of the city, i.e. that the construction of the wall completely changed the contours of the city. And third, it shows that the wall encircles and chokes Palestinian localities, removing them from their natural relationship with the city and paralyzing their ability to develop while going out of its way to enfold Jewish localities into the city and connect them to it. So. That's one of the things, I mean, there's so many things that when you can actually zoom in and out and see the interactivities, I think these maps are extremely, extremely powerful. Um, and also, I want to point out that we have this feature in the legend that you can turn on and off. The, this is the plan, this is the separation wall. You can turn it on and off and see it with or without each of these layers as you, as you like. Our time is limited today, but I really do urge you to explore these realities more by reading about the, um, the, uh, this topic and also by looking at the map. Now, another thing that we've done is graphics, to tell the story in graphics. So here we have a related graphic that's related to the story of the wall. What, um, this graphic adds a layer of analysis to what we saw on the map a moment ago. Um, it explains at a glance how the interplay between the Jerusalem municipal boundary and the separation wall works. Remember, both of these are unilaterally imposed by Israel on the area and its people, and uh, they create it, the, the interplay creates different types of entrapments for Palestinian localities, fragmenting and asphyxiating Palestinian Jerusalem generally and resulting in its dismantlement. So this particular graphic, we did this analysis and we found these different ways in which, you know, you can see it in the map, like if they're cut off from the city by the wall, we called it an exclave. If they're surrounded, you know, in a certain way, we called it an enclave. And what, what our analysis showed is that only 30%, 35, 30.5% of Palestinian localities are actually untouched by this interplay between, or, un I mean, they're within both the wall and the boundary, so one consider, could consider them not to be entrapped, although they're <laughs> entrapped inside the wall. But these are the areas inside the city. This 30% actually turns out to be the areas where the settler takeovers and forcible expulsions are focused because they, they, these areas are taken care of by kind of choking them and boxing them off. Um, so, so just I think that the graphics tell the story in a very powerful way. And, and, and unique way, and um, I encourage you to enjoy those graphics as well after we uh, are completed here. Now let's move on and explore the other topics of the website because topics is only one part of what we have. So we have these topics and themes, but underneath here we also have a blog. Uh, I'm going to go quicker now. So our blog is called Jerusalem Notebook. And it, on it we feature all manners of stories about the Palestinian community of Jerusalem. This could be anything from character profiles to interviews to historical sketches of landmarks or traditions that the community holds dear or book reviews or vlogs and more. And we're hoping to open this space up to guest bloggers. So anybody who has you know, suggestions there, love to hear that. Uh, we, after the uh, blog, we have a bios section. Now, the bios is specific to Jerusalem. We are profiling Palestinian Jerusalemites past and present 
famous and obscure, whose lives and stories have helped shape the larger Jerusalem story and the story of their community within it over time. And we find that through exploring these individual lives in some depth, we uh, discover overlooked or forgotten aspects of the community's story. And as well, we find that themes commonly uh, emerge, re-emerge. So we, we see themes from era to era, you know, family to family, all kinds of things through, through doing these bios. And as well, we take the bios and we thread them through the content in the story. So if a, if a backgrounder research has touches on this person's life, we can present it within the backgrounder and they can have that um, understanding amplified by seeing the bio. So the next section is our quick facts section. This is sort of for the researcher on a deadline. It's, um, it's just a co collection of short and simple quick takes to help clarify key questions about the Jerusalem story. So if we see, let's say, um, when did Israel occupy East Jerusalem? The answer is there. And if, the, if there's a related topic on the website, it's clicked and you can, you can go to it in that way. The next section is our lexicon. So this uh, is uh, to help the reader because terminology in the Jerusalem context can be complex and also controversial. And words and their meanings shape narratives. So our lexicon goes beyond standard definitions and also offers, where applicable, nuanced shades of meaning that matter to Palestinian Jerusalemites. And these terms are hyperlinked within the text for easy reference, so as you're reading, you can click and go to the definition that you want. Now I'm going to show you a section that is not actually developed, but it's on the books for development. We built the infrastructure and design for it with a vision in mind. Um, it won't be, it's in the next phase of the website, but this is what it's going to be. It's called our Kutzipedia. And our Kutzipedia is meant to be a, like a uh, library of reference and research that are uh, resources that will amplify what's on the website. It won't duplicate or repeat, it'll be extra. Um, and it'll be a special repository of knowledge and scholarship relevant to the story of Palestinians of Jerusalem. And we hope that it will inspire new scholarship on this topic and build in, you know, energy. Um, we also have room for collections. So we, we hope to have like collections of photos, collections of maps. I mean, this is a, this is a vision of a serious online future, future library for, for all of these types of um, materials. Last but not least, we have a directory of organizations on the ground. So we, we felt that it's very important to give Palestinian organizations wh which are struggling, as noted by, by Dr. Jobi, they're struggling from all different angles and we wanted to create a, uh, a directory of them, Palestinian organizations on the ground that work on Jerusalem. So here it is, uh, we have pull, pulled it all together and you can search this directory by organization type, by area of work, and by location relative to the wall and the municipal boundary because the research team felt that was important enough to include because it so affects daily life, whether you're in the wall, outside the wall, as we started to see in that map. Now, I did just want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the efforts of our, uh, my team and the, the project uh, team. So they're here on the about page. We, we were thinking to pipe them in today, but that didn't quite work out. So I just wanted to show the team and their, um, yeah. <laughs> they've really worked really, really, really hard. Um, in conclusion, we hope to create a virtual space that can serve as an evolving hub for this community's stories and lived realities. We aim to recreate community, restore connection, give voice, inspire research, build knowledge, and shine a hard spotlight on the dystopian policies that are causing immeasurable harm to so many in a unique and historic city that should be a cherished world treasure. Now, we do have a place where if you want to get involved, you can volunteer. And that is our uh, volunteer form. So if you click on this, 
You can fill it out in Arabic or English, and you can let us know all about what you'd like to contribute to the project, because we need more people. <laughs> um, and the, the other thing that I wanted to really, really ask you all now, you're here, the site's live, we have our social media up and running, we want to gain energy and momentum, so please follow us and share and uh, use, we have a QR code that is going to be on the screen, I believe, that you can hold your phone up. There it is. Hold your phone up and you'll have everything you need to just get right on the bandwagon. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you to the team. We'd like to thank you for this uh, project that is uh, diverse. Uh, very diverse indeed, which is uh, a reference uh, for individuals and persons who are interested in this history. I would like to thank you very much. Uh, we have come to the end uh, of this uh, meeting here today, and I would like to reiterate my thanks on behalf uh, of the uh, Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. I would like to thank Dr. Joaba, and I would like to thank you all uh, and uh, looking forward to meeting you once again next year. Good night. Thank you.